This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today on the show, we'll welcome Matt Rota from Healthy Gulf to talk about the work they're doing to keep the gulf fit for the many of the animals that call it home. He'll also talk about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative and ways that you can get involved. So what's your favorite part of the gulf? We'd love to hear from you today. As always, Dr. Major is here ready for pet questions, and Libby likes to help you with your latest brushes with nature. Join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. If you miss the Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. Uh, let's start with you. I think you've got a couple of events that you wanted to tell us about. Yeah, good morning, Kevin. Uh, Clinton Nature Center is having a firefly walk tomorrow night. That's Friday, May the 20th at 830. And uh, Paul and I will be there <clears throat> uh, talking about fireflies and just basically showing people the fireflies. It's a great time to see them. So um, if you're in the area, it would uh, it's be a fun, fun night, although it may be late. If you want to stay late, you can. 830 seems late to start an event. People always say, why don't you start it earlier? And I said, because the fireflies <laughs> don't start it earlier. So, yeah. We'd have nothing to see firefly-wise. And then um, up at uh, close to the Starkville, Columbus area, Noxaby Wildlife Refuge has a bio blitz going on Saturday. And there's a lot. There's nature walks zeroing in on certain fauna all through the day. Early in the morning, it'll be birding, I think 6.30 to 8.30 birding. And there's a plant walk and a herp walk and an insect walk. So uh Go online and um, kind of see the schedule if you want to get over there. You could stay all day and do them all, which will probably exhaust you, but uh, uh, or come and go as you want to, to see things. But it's uh, Noxaby Wildlife Refuge. That's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service facility. And at our house, um, life has been centered around the fireflies at night. Uh, this is a really good year, and of course, then uh, the big event, I guess I better say, is at the um, Mississippi Crafts Center mm-hmm. uh, in Ridgeland, and there should be lots of fireflies. We're at peak. Every place I've gone this weekend will be the, the peak population numbers for synchronous fireflies, and then they'll be gone probably in 10 days. You won't be able to see them, so... Now's the time to get outside wherever you are. If you're north of here, uh, they may just be starting. So kind of start checking your dark places in the yard to see what's going on. And um, I've got several comments this week about the um, predaceous or um, the, the birds that parasitize other birds' nests. And so I did some reading, and uh, some people evidently couldn't get enough of it. They want to know more about brown-headed cowbirds and yellow-billed cuckoos. Nick Winstead uh, works for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and he's the ornithologist at the museum. And he had uh, written a good article back in 2020 that's online and easy to to Google and find that tells you all about yellow-billed cuckoos. And interestingly enough, uh, new information that's been gleaned from recent uh, studies. Some, you know, there's a lot of really cool um, bird behavior studies going on, and we're finding new things out about species of birds all the time. When I was back in the day, when I was in school, we learned that old word, old world cuckoos like the birds that are called cuckoos in Europe or they parasitize nests and what they call an obligate parasite in, in that that's the only way they can raise their eggs like we talked about uh, brown headed cowbirds that's pretty much the only well it is the only way they can raise their eggs is to put them in somebody else's nest 
So the cuckoos in the U.S., the yellow-billed and the black-billed cuckoos, we had said were not nest parasites. And while it is true that they can build a nest and raise their own young all they want, they are a real interesting bird in that they kind of specialize in eating either big insects, like they love cicadas. So when there's a a plethora of cicadas, you know, we've talked about that. Some years they have the the big um, emergence of cicadas and we're covered up with them. During those years, they lay a lot of eggs, and then they also can eat the fuzzy caterpillars. They're one of the few birds that really likes eating those caterpillars that are hairy. And so when you get uh, those tent caterpillar outbreaks, they get a lot of food then too. And it's a, a kind of a weird biological thing in that they have a compulsion to lay more eggs if they eat more, which is, I guess, a good thing. So then their egg too many for their nests. So they fill their nest up, and then first they look for other cuckoos. So they stay within their species as much as possible, distribute those eggs. If they can't find any more, then they've, new research has shown 11 different species, robins, uh, wood thrush, several birds that they will um, lay their eggs in the nest. So uh, anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. It's like they've they're just compelled to lay those eggs, and they've got to find somewhere to do it. Whereas the brown-headed cowbird, the the theory is, I think, still that they evolved following the herds of buffalo, the brown-headed cowbirds. You know, we had buffalo here even at one time, and so they weren't in a place where they could lay an egg in a nest and tend it and stay there. So they evolved. They you know, they're kind of migratory even during nesting season. With the, uh, So they lay their eggs in whatever bird's nest they found as they were traveling around with the buffalo. So they, they just didn't evolve to make a nest at all. Although they will, they, there's been new research that they kind of monitor where they've left their eggs if they can, and they'll go around the nest where they've left egg, an egg and um, vocalize so that the baby birds can hear their voice and then they know to go to brown-headed cowbirds' sounds when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So they learn that, but they can even kind of retaliate. If they go to a nest and lay an egg and that bird detects the egg and throws it out, they've been documented that sometimes they tear that nest up. (laughs) Like... (laughs) I'll show you. But what they think it is is an attempt to make that bird build another nest so then they can leave another egg. So <laughs> Those it's a wild birds, world they are, out there. They are yeah. true bullies of the bird <laughs> of the bird world. Seemingly so, but beautiful with a beautiful song, and they found a way to get along in the world. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's work in one uh, pet email for Dr. Major before our first break. And uh, good morning, Dr. Major. This one says... Uh, sometimes the cats scratch on the cement around their feeding tray before or after eating. The food is always fresh. It makes me think that the food smells bad and that they want to cover it up. All of them don't do it, and not every time they eat. We Why do they sometimes briefly scratch the area besides their tray? And my cat does that as well. Also with my food, it's funny if he, he gets where and he'll start doing that. And I always think that, again, it's some sort of commentary on my uh, culinary skills. So, uh, Dr. Major, why what's the cat scratching uh, all about? That's a great question. And, of course, dogs, I know looking at uh, dogs here, if they don't, uh, when we're boarding or have hospitalized dogs, sometimes they will literally just root and turn their <laughs> bowl over if they don't like the food. As far as the cats, though, scratching, uh, I think it's a habit, and there's really no indication, in my opinion, that they dislike it. Most of them would go on and eat. It may be something similar to where they use a scratching post, Uh you know, why do cats use scratching posts? Uh, if you can answer that, they don't <laughs> keep, their claw, keep their claws sharp, I guess. But uh, I cannot give you a, an absolute reason why they would be scratching on the concrete or the floor uh, around the bowl. My cats, my cats are ready to eat, and they, they, don't, they don't really <laughs> they don't mess they around. Don't really care, right. Could it be that their the old idea of maybe out in the wild they had to cover up their foods to hide it from other uh, animals, and that's kind of a a, 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 feed, a throwback to that. 
possibly, and uh, cat behavior, you know, changes. I'm not sure exactly that that's the case or that they were even trying to cover it up, but certainly uh, if somebody can help us with that in a more psychological uh, uh, effort, I would say give us a call, but I don't think it's a bad thing, but at the same time, uh, it is probably a habit that they've developed. Well, and it's also good to know that it is not a, a criticism of my cat of my of my cooking skills. So that's uh, that is good to know. Although you know, I will say that the the amazing sense of smell. He, I had a bag of unopened cat food on the counter, uh, and it was not unopened for very long because I came back a couple hours later, and he had sort of torn into the new bag, even though he had a, a bowl of food waiting for him at his usual spot. So I think. Uh, he that new 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 food smell is is too much for him to resist sometimes. Oh, it's, a lot of times it's really fresh, and you know they they can detect that through the bag. I'm sure, but they don't have any problems uh, ripping into a bag if they really want to. This is Creature Comforts, and it's time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll talk to Matt Rota from Healthy Golf about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative and the work that Healthy Golf does as a whole. Dr. Major and Libby will stay on hand, ready for your pet questions and encounters with nature. And I think we also have a special guest we're going to call here in just a minute as well. You can call in to join the conversation with questions and comments. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. We're back on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. If you want to join our conversation this morning with a question or a comment, just call 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. We're going to talk to our guest, Matt Rhoda, Senior Policy Director at Healthy Golf, in just a minute. Uh, But first, uh, Libby, we have another guest on the line, and if you could go ahead and and introduce it for us. Um, I I know David Elder just because he's interested in fireflies as well, and he has synchronous fireflies on his property south of here in Covington, Louisiana. So he gives us a email or a message every year when his are uh, blinking and uh, tells us to get ready. So this year he said he had some really unusually interesting experiences with fireflies on his place and on some property close by that I think is in his family and that he would like to share it with our listeners. So I think he's on the line, Liz. Go ahead, uh, David. Thanks for joining us. What do you have for us today? Yes, I'll be glad to. Let me, uh, a little, uh, just a little background. Um, I grew up in New Orleans, and sure, we had we had little flashing bugs. We had, you know, one at a time. It was nice. But then we, we bought this property across Lake Pont Street, still New Orleans, got into Louisiana, built a house in the forest with some longleaf pines and some cypress and one evening, I walk outside and glance to my right, and wow, I, I just, I just couldn't believe it. What in the world is that? These, these beetles, these, these male fireflies, were gathering together and snapping at the same time. Synchronous snappies, they call them. I'd never seen such. Uh, no, I had my neighbors, as a matter of fact, y'all. And uh, so I read about these things and decided to call LSU bug people. And uh, I told them, look, I know this synchronous stuff goes on in the Smokies and elsewhere, but but New Orleans, really, for crying out loud. So LSU sent a team down, I want you to know. And, and all I wanted, I told them it was a parking place for some LSU football games, okay? <laughs> but uh, I didn't get what I wanted. But let me tell you all. It, it's so amazing, these, these snappies and, and synchrony in the thousands. Early May, yeah. Two weeks from from now, uh, May fifth actually was the peak. Um, and my having been established, yeah, for the past two years as the earliest sighting of the snappies in North America, 
in the around the city of New Orleans. It doesn't make any sense. But our grandchildren just think we are we discovered the universe. So uh and, and it's been a great year with the Snappies. Every year we just wait for it and walk outside. Uh so, but I'd be glad to answer any question that y'all can imagine. Uh, you mentioned that you um, had seen a lot of other or several other species of fireflies, too. Did, did, do you know the names of those? You might just tell us something. You, you were saying that high in the trees you saw a lot. Yeah, we did. And uh, what's interesting, I, I think about names, uh, Libby, is when, when you really read the names of this species and that species and this species, they, they seem to... Uh, now, I'm 73 years old, but they seem to, like, come together. They, they oh, goodness, is that, did I misspell that or something? But anyway, tree toppers is what you're referring to, and, and, and that's good. And to call them snappies is easy. But when, when I get into the scientific names, I go nuts. But, yeah, we had a lot of tree toppers, and we still have a lot of fireflies now. No synchrony. They're all dead. And uh, no synchrony, but uh, it, it's amazing because they start... In, in March, just a, a few little gentle flashes. And, uh, I, you know, some of the things like like recognizing why 100 males, 50 males, 1,000 males, uh, would, would gather together. How in the world? And, and, and I keep asking that question of, of people. How in the world can they get together and all of a sudden send the male down to get married? You know, <laughs> it, it doesn't... It, it's really amazing. It just is. But, yeah, we have a whole bunch of uh, different types of fireflies, but it's the snappies that are so exciting. And, uh, David, I guess the different types of fireflies, uh, it's not all the same color or the same uh, frequency or patterns that they use. Absolutely, it isn't. And uh, sometimes it, the little treetop is a little bit more yellow. And then there's some that we call the boxers. I don't know what the, what the scientific name is, but they... They flash down. They're just violent as heck. And they flash down the midway up down to about uh, five feet and then just start attacking everything that they see. So they, and, and I, I, I would bet that we have in, in North Shore, New Orleans, I would bet that we've got about five, if not six or seven little species that do things, everything, do everything different. But the snappies are the most exciting, I have to admit. All right, uh, David, we appreciate you calling in this morning and, and joining us on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. And uh, thanks for your insight on the fireflies. And uh, as Libby mentioned, uh, it's a chance here in central Mississippi. And then uh, in the coming week or so, maybe they'll move north. So folks who live north of the Jackson area, be on the lookout for these because they are definitely coming your way. So uh, we'll welcome now to our show our other guest, Matt Rota, who is the Senior Policy Director of Healthy Gulf. Uh, Matt, if you could start out, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Rota, and I'm the Senior Policy Director for Healthy Gulf. We're an environmental organization based in New Orleans, but have uh, staff in four of the five Gulf states, including uh, Mississippi. We have um, Andrew Whitehurst, who has been on your show before, I believe, uh, lives just outside of Jackson. And uh, so we focus on uh, making sure that communities um, have the resources to protect their waters, whether it's fresh water, wetlands, um, the, and obviously the Gulf of Mexico to make sure that we can preserve our natural resources for generations to come and communities can thrive and depend on them. Um, so how does the Mississippi River play into the mission of Healthy Gulf? Well, uh, the Mississippi River is the, the largest uh, freshwater input of the, the Gulf, and so it really feeds the Gulf. It feeds the, feeds the fisheries, feeds... Um, well, literally built uh, where I live, which is in New Orleans, uh, li literally built the land down here. And uh, but we've uh, done quite a bit to alter it, change it from the water quality to um, changing its path and levying it off. So uh, we really see the Mississippi River as uh, really a an extension of the Gulf because it is such a vital uh, vital for the ecosystem that is in the Gulf, as well as uh, vital 
for trying to clean it up and getting it uh, for restoration and coastal restoration. Um, what would you say are maybe some of the main uh, threats to the health of the Gulf of Mexico? Well, there are quite there are several threats to the Gulf of Mexico for sure. Um, one of them from the Mississippi River is the Gulf dead zone that forms every year, where fertilizer pollution flows down the Mississippi River and causes algae blooms, which in turn cause d- dissolved oxygen uh, depletion or hypoxia. And uh, sea life needs to swim away or it suffocates because it has an area up to the size of New Jersey where there is little to no oxygen for our bottom dwelling critters to to survive. Um, And additionally, uh, that sometimes um, that Mississippi has experienced this as well. Uh, Whenever we open up the Bonnie Carey spillway that uh, puts floodwaters into the Lake Pontchartrain, which ends up going over to the Mississippi Sound. That pollution and that fresh water can also impact uh, the Mississippi Sound as well. And we saw some really bad impacts a couple of years ago where the um, the oyster fishery basically got it was just decimated by the toxic algae blooms that were caused by putting Mississippi River water into Lake Ponch Train and into the into the sound. So if you would talk maybe about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative, what is what is that all about? Sure. It's it's something it's really exciting. We're excited about this. You don't hear a lot of good news coming out of Congress these days, uh, no matter what your political uh, leanings are, it seems. Um, and the Mississippi River Restoration Resilience Initiative is a something that's being proposed in the House of Representatives right now. Um, it was introduced by Betty McCollum, our uh, representative up in St. Paul and um, Minneapolis area up in Minnesota. And this is to raise the profile of the Mississippi River. You know, you have programs like the Great Lakes Initiative, the Chesapeake Bay Initiative, that are programs that put money towards the restoring and the protection of those great waterways. And the Mississippi River doesn't have that. Uh, We don't have a dedicated program with dedicated funds to promote good projects on the river. And so this was proposed um, by uh, Representative McCollum and it's gaining support. And so that's really, we're really excited to see, because in my view, the Mississippi River is the most important freshwater waterway in our nation and it it's time for it to be uh respected that way and to be put having the funds in a non-regulatory manner to make sure that everybody who wants to use the river can use it and it's a, a benefit for the communities that surround it and so is this currently being uh debated in in congress it, it hasn't been it isn't being debated right now. It's been introduced. Um, and so we're still trying to uh, garner uh, garner support for it before it gets um, taken to the committee and the floor. Uh, but we, we're, we're getting some really great support. Uh, Representative Benny Thompson in Mississippi is a co-sponsor. Um, Representative Carter in Louisiana is a co-sponsor. And so we have um, some really great support, and that's that's one reason you know I'm coming on here is to raise the profile and get people to talk to their um, their senators and their representatives to say that this is this is good. Uh, there's nothing. This is shouldn't be a partisan issue. It's completely non-regulatory, and uh, we just want to give Missis- the Mississippi River what it the money and the restoration that it deserves. Uh, So what would the initiative be able to do for local communities located along the Mississippi? Uh, Well, it's this, like I said, this would be a non-regulatory grant based program. And one of the things and I can't give a ton of specifics because one of the important parts of it that as, as it's written right now is that once it was established, the first step would be to have a plan uh, developed. Um, an action plan developed, which would include community and uh, public input to make sure that the communities that are around the river have a voice and can uh, put forward what they say, what they think is the most important things to uh, restore and to protect, um, whether it's a floodplain reintroduction 
or um, uh, or drinking water protection or access or um, endangered species reduction or I'm not not endangered species sorry uh, uh, invasive species reduction um, and uh, so but this could uh, go towards things like um, improving floodplain management in waters that flow into the Mississippi River, access to the access to the Mississippi River and its tributaries, um, projects that are on farms to restore and reduce uh, fertilizer runoff that goes in, into the rivers. It could uh, help with coastal restoration down in Louisiana, making sure that we're using uh, the dredge material that we dig up in the Mississippi River for coastal restoration instead of dumping it off into the Gulf of Mexico. So there are a lot of possibilities with this. Um, and another thing that we think is really important with this is that, um, as it's written right now, 35% of this money would go towards um, towards disadvantaged communities, um, communities of color and persistent poverty uh, counties to make sure that communities that have are, are struggling can use some of these monies to make to improve their relationship with the river and improve their communities as well. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. It's time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue our discussion with our guest today, Matt Rhoda from Healthy Gulf, about the work they're doing uh, to protect Gulf waters. Also, Dr. Major, always ready for your pet questions. Call in with questions and comments. Our phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest today, Matt Rhoda, senior policy director for Healthy Gulf. If you ever miss any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast. Just use your podcasting app to search for Creature Comforts and add it to it, and you'll get every uh, episode each week. Also, download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone, and then you get to listen to all of the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Again, our phone number, if you'd like to join the conversation this morning, is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two. 7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. More with Matt Rota in just a minute. But Dr. Major, we've got another pet email here for you. And this one, kind of a sad story. Our six-month-old dog recently was hit by a car, leaving her blind. What can we do to help her acclimate to her new disability? We've resourced information on Google, but would like any information that uh, Dr. Major could give to us. Dr. Major, you still with us? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's totally, totally sad. Uh, she's six months old, they said, and I guess she is totally blind. So if she is mobile and everything, I I suppose at her age, she's going to have to be obviously inside. Uh, I would prepare areas for her that she can navigate and a lot of the dogs do quite well uh, from memory and i'm not sure about this dog it'd be interesting to talk to the owner uh just to get a little bit more information but uh a safe place sometimes a companion helps and i've seen dogs that are blind that uh certainly you wouldn't think they were because they go with their friend if you will whether it's a cat or a dog and have a bond with them to get around so not knowing any more about this situation, uh, maybe they could call either at a later date or uh, tell us more about this. But best of luck, and it's going to take some time and effort uh, to take care of this this little dog. Uh, but obviously, too, you know, uh, uh, establish a relationship with a local vet, and, and that you you, you oh, can definitely yeah. do do a lot to help out in, in that uh, instance. So right. Right, and I, I'm assuming that the dog has no other major injuries other than 
I guess, blindness. So that may, it may work out well. I've seen blind dogs that do quite well. The fact that it's a young puppy, I mean, is that an advantage and that it would have more time to sort of learn to adapt to to the new reality? Well, I think so. And, of course, being a puppy, not again, not knowing what kind of dog it is or how exuberant it, it is, uh, I would say that that is an advantage, yes. We're visiting today on Creature Comforts with Matt Rhoda from Healthy Golf. Uh, Matt, we want to talk about some of the other work that Healthy Golf does, but before we leave the uh, discussion about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative, um, I think that you know sometimes for people to get behind something, there needs to be a face, maybe a, an animal or cute some sort of creature that people might could identify with. When we talk about some of the work that might be done with the initiative, what sorts of animals uh, along the river could be affected and, and maybe their situation improved? Well, there's... Um I would say, you know, any animal, especially that relies on, you know, clean water and uh, the floodplains of the Mississippi River could be um, uh, definitely be a help with this. You know, you f- from the the sturgeon that go up the up the Mississippi River are um, while they aren't necessarily the um, I guess you would say prettiest uh, <laughs> fish, but they are just and amazing i'm sure you've talked about it i think i've heard you all talk about it talking about them before just what amazing creatures they are they look like they you know they're they look like dinosaurs and they're amazing um and that they're that 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 habitat could be could be improved and then you got some more of the um things like your your river otters and, and things like that that uh, you know thrive in the in the floodplain and batcher areas and uh you know can't get can't get enough of those guys and then just then also you know the mississippi river is you know the 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 major flyway of the um entire continent and uh migratory um migratory birds neotropical migrants waterfowl um all are um creatures that could be could benefit through putting money towards coastal restoration and flood flood um flood protection uh, floodplain management and um, and pollution reduction. So uh, when we talk about the Gulf of Mexico, we touched on uh, in the first segment the the dead zone. And again, I think if you you told us that that's basically things like pesticides and that sort of thing that wash down the Mississippi River into the Gulf, and basically is it like they suck all the oxygen out of out of that part of the Gulf, and then so nothing is able to exist in there? Is that do, do I have that right? Uh, uh, pretty much, uh, it's it's uh, fertilizer pollution and other um, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution that comes down the Mississippi River, mainly from um, farming, but also through sewage treatment plants and uh, petrochemical facilities. And whenever that uh, that pollution gets to the to the Gulf to the salt water, it causes massive algae blooms. And those blooms, um, the algae dies, it sinks to the bottom, and then bacteria go, eats up all that extra organic material, and at the same time, they use up the oxygen on the bottom layer of, of the Gulf. And that's what causes the dead zone. You have this huge area up to the size of New Jersey at the mouth of the Mississippi River, basically all along the Louisiana coast, getting into Mississippi a bit and getting into, in, getting into Texas, where um, creatures that, that can swim, they, they can swim away, um, but other things like sea stars and uh, shrimp and other bottom-dwelling creatures uh, can often suffocate and die. And is the, is the dead zone in the same area geographically every year? I mean, I, wish, I would imagine with currents and things that this is not a static uh, thing, but it, it moves. Is that correct? It, it it ebbs and flows, uh, but the general area where you basically will always find it is along the uh, the continental shelf, a lot from the Mississippi <clears throat> River west, or is the really the areas where you'll see most of it because there's a big um, shelf before it drops off into the deep ocean, and it forms on that shelf. Once it once you get to the deep ocean, then you don't have then it doesn't have the conditions to form, so. It ebbs and flows within that area, depending on how much flow is coming out of the Mississippi River and the tides and the winds. You know, for example, when you have lots of hurricanes, that mixes up the water, and so the dead zone isn't as big sometimes because of hurricanes. Um, that's not the solution to the dead zone that I advocate <laughs> for. Um, but uh, so it's it yeah it's it's 
it's dynamic, but it's also very reliable. That it's it's going to be there, and uh, there's some really good models to predict based on the amount of pollution that's in the Mississippi River, um, how how big the dead zone is going to be. And so it never really goes away. You're just saying it, it based on conditions, the size uh, and maybe slight location of it changes. Yeah, and it, it gets bigger in the summer and it gets smaller and often disappears in the winter because, um, you know, around the, the warmer it is, the more uh, condi- the better conditions you have of the stratification of the the fresh water coming in and the salt water because they're different temperatures. And so that keeps the low oxygen on the bottom and uh, so it doesn't get mixed up. So in the summer is when it gets really big. And that's when uh, the crew from uh, LSU and the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium go out uh, end of end of July, early August every year to do the official measurement. They're out for about a week and doing running transects to um, check the, the dissolved oxygen to give the um, the annual official size. Um, what what kind of threat to healthy Gulf waters is uh, oil drilling? Um, oil drilling has a huge impact on on the Gulf. Um, I mean, you ha- you obviously have the BPs uh, that happen, um, and that that risk can't be understated. And you know, we still are seeing impacts from uh, the BP drilling disaster with um, oil in the marshes and things like that. We also have uh, um, for example, the Taylor oil spill, which is uh, kind of east of the Mississippi River, um, southeast of the Mississippi River mouth. And that spill has been leaking um, since before Katrina. Um, so, um, yeah, it's been leaking for 20 some odd years. And uh, it's been just leaking and leaking and leaking and they finally um the, got in there and a company said figured out a way to actually collect that oil that is leaking or the majority of that oil that's that's coming up but that leaked for 20 like i said 20 some odd years and just the more exploration and the more drilling that we have out there the more chances we have for um, ruptures of Uh, pipelines and other disasters as well as the human toll as well we can't ever forget the um the men and women that that die out on it's very dangerous work um whether it's you know the bp explosion which is obviously an extreme event but uh, it's it's very dangerous work and making sure that that um they're taken care of as well Uh, so is research being done to help prevent uh, drilling spills, or is it pretty much a response after it happens? Regretfully, it's it's mainly a response after it happens. Um, so a few after BP, a few uh, regulations like requiring um, double blow up preventers and things like that were put into place. But in the years after that, um, those some of those protections actually got removed and got backtracked. And so, really. It's 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 about response and our response technologies honestly haven't uh, improved um, for for decades. It's still um, boom, burn, and disperse are the you know the techniques that they've they've been using since well before uh, the BP disaster, and it's still basically the same type of response. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Time for one final break this hour. When we get back, we'll come to wrap up our conversation with Matt Rhoda from Healthy Gulf. Talk about ways that maybe the everyday person can get involved to keep the Gulf healthy. Still time to call in with a question or comment, though. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Back to wrap things up after this. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield, and our guest for today is Matt Rhoda from Healthy Gulf. 
We've got some open phone lines. Show's running out, but if you uh, call quickly, we could get you in at one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number, it's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can send an email to us at any time. It's animals at mpbonline.org. So, Matt, I think when we talk about things like uh, protecting the Gulf of Mexico, the individual person thinks to themselves, well, you know, I'm all for that, but there's not really a lot that I can do to help. Are there things that the average person could do to help improve the health of the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, there are um, you know, more political things and there's more physical things that you can do. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, it's really easy to shoot an email or give a call to your uh, representative and senator to support uh, the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative, calling it MIRI, um, and uh, that only only takes a minute. But also you have uh, things like, while you know, the vast majority of the pollution that goes in the Mississippi River comes from farming activities and more industrial activities, I know that a lot, you know, a vast majority of uh, Mississippi is farmland. And so if you own farmland or if you um, know people that do talk to them about um, how they're managing their, their fertilizer inputs and... Um, and then if you live on at a house uh, that has a lawn, you know, f- at least follow the directions for your lawn fertilizer. And uh, I, I'm an advocate of uh, not fertilizing your your lawn at all. I'm I, I usually am a fan whenever my th- it gets too warm and I don't have to mow, mow the lawn as much when it burns off. But I might just be a la- lazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and so I, those are some some things, you know, really, really noticing and then. Um, Another thing is uh, stormwater management is, you know, a lot of places where you live that you want to get the water off your property as quickly as possible, which is understandable. But installing grass waterways, um, rain gardens and um, wetlands and putting in native plants all can really help. Um, keep the water where it needs to be uh, because we want to slow down that water, let it get into the, the soil and to nurture those plants and the animals that thrive on those plants instead of going getting shot straight into the ditch and eventually into waterways where it can cause a real problem. Um, So if someone wanted to contact uh, their representative uh, about either the health of the Gulf in general or the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative, is there a source that they could go to to sort of give them the ammunition to, you know, to have uh, something that, uh, you know, know what they're talking about, I guess is what I'm trying to say. For sure. You can go to um, HealthyGulf.org. We have uh, a lot of information there um, is uh, probably the the easiest place to to go to um, to get more information about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative, as well as um, lots of different things that, that we're working on. We've got a caller on the line and we'll say good morning to Barbara. Thanks for calling, Barbara. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I just want to make a comment about the blind puppy. Okay. Uh, one, I've dealt with several blind animals through the years. One thing that I've found that really helps is to put a bell on, bell on either the people or a companion that the animal may have. And it's amazing because they will learn that the bell represents a friend. And the the biggest thing I've run into with a dog that is blind is fear body. But once the, they realize that a, a person is approaching them or a friend, it just lowers their anxiety and they aren't nearly as, as likely to fear bite. All right, Barbara, that's a, a good uh, thought and, again, broke up a little bit. So I think what Barbara was saying was that if you have a dog that has lost its sight uh, to for maybe the companion that you get for it or when you're around, there's a bell so that the dog then associates the bell with friendliness. And so that helps because you can imagine, you know, if a dog can't see that it is probably afraid of things that it encounters. So, Barbara, thanks for that. That's a good uh, a good tip uh, to uh, to for the folks who have the blind dog. As we wrap up with our guest, Matt Rota from Healthy Gulf. Matt, uh, got a couple of minutes. Is there any issue about health of the Gulf that we haven't talked about that maybe is uh, people are not as aware of as other issues? 
Yeah, um, I think there's one issue that we uh, need that would need to be talked about is, uh, you know, we've there's been a lot more about talking about exporting natural gas um, because of the war in Ukraine and a bunch of other things. Um, and as there's there are talks about that, we are concerned of the impacts that this expansion of this uh, um, all the infrastructure that would be necessary could really impact communities that are already suffering from a ton of pollution, wetland destruction, and things like that. And so I just want people to, uh, and one thing that we're working on is to really acknowledge the costs of um, expanding our petrochemical development and making sure that if we do that, that communities that are already impacted are taken care of and uh, that we're protecting all of uh, the people that live and thrive and depend upon the resources of the Gulf. I might be putting you on the spot here, but do you have an idea or could you give us an idea of the sort of the economic impact that the the Gulf has? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a recreation spot, but how important is the Gulf of Mexico to our country? Uh, the Gulf is really important. It's a, a multi-million dollar, and I, I don't have the figure in front of me, and I apologize for that, um, a multi-million dollar uh, fisheries uh, input that it has um and that and it's also obviously a huge recreational opportunity and as as you get into you know east of louisiana into mississippi alabama and then obviously florida just all of the tourism that is um uh happens on the gulf it's just it's an absolute treasure and so we need to remember that while um the Mississippi River and the Gulf are vital for our transportation and for um, moving uh, goods in and out of the United States and up and throughout the Midwest. That also we need to make sure that we're doing those things to, in order to, in a way that also protects um, the vast, the millions, if not billions, of dollars of um, commerce and and um, activity that happens in the Gulf. Very, very well said. Thank you, Matt, today for uh, helping us uh, learn more about some issues affecting the, the health of the Gulf of Mexico. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners. If you need to hear today's show or previous show, you can go to mpbonline.org slash Creature Comforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener this week was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest, Matt Rhoda, I'm Kevin Farrell. Inviting you to stay tuned because up next, it's autocorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts heard only on MPB Think Radio.